Hi there. Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Karsten Lund. I'm curator at the Renaissance Society. Um, as some of you may know, we're a contemporary art institution located here at the University of Chicago, um, really kind of focused on presenting new exhibitions and other projects with artists. And maybe one time a year, we also organize a group exhibition that might grow out of a set of ideas and kind of develop from there. Um, so it's um, really my pleasure to have today's event uh, on the occasion of our current exhibition, Fear of Property, which I organized. Um, quickly, really a big thanks to the Van Wart Keeble family for their generous support of that show, which made that and all um, related programs possible too. Um, for Fear of Property kind of grew out of my interest to invite a bunch of artists to join me in thinking about property in its myriad forms, um, its kind of past, its presence and its futures thinking about this as an abstract idea that has so many kind of concrete effects, um, kind of lingering at times with some of its contradictions and thinking about it not only as a legal or economic structure, but also some of its econ um, emotional or psychic dimensions too. Um, and I will say too, that like I am not an expert on property. So walking into an exhibition like this, I approach it more kind of with a spirit of curiosity rather than one of authority. And in that kind of spirit too, I really see the opening of an exhibition um, as the beginning or another beginning or a midpoint rather than an end point. And it really is such an interesting thing to think with other people as well as the artists involved about kind of where this might lead us and what emerges from the new artworks that have been made for the occasion. Um, and also many, many kind of conversations that can happen within its larger orbit. Um, so the exhibition itself is on view for one more week through November 6th at our space in Cobb Hall, just a short walk from here on Ellis Avenue up on the fourth floor. Um, we're open um, five days a week and we're always completely free. Um, but today I think I'm really thrilled to have Jonathan Levy here with me um, to give some of his impressions first and then also kind of will engage in conversation too. Um, for those of you who don't know John, I'll give a very quick introduction before passing it on. Um, Jonathan Levy is a historian with interest in the relationships among business history, political economy, legal history, and the history of ideas and culture. He is the James Westfall Thompson Press Professor of U.S. History, Fundamentals, Social Thought, and the College at the University of Chicago. He is also the current Faculty Director of the Law, Letters, and Society Program, and a Fellow of the Chicago Center for Contemporary Theory, who I'm thrilled are our co-presenters um, for today's event as well. So big thanks to 3CT. Um, Levy's recent book, Ages of American Capitalism, A History of the United States, is kind of an amazing, ambitious, single-volume history of the U.S., that reveals how capitalism in America has evolved um, through four distinct ages and how the country's economic evolution is inseparable from the nature of the economic life itself. Um, his first book, Freaks of Fortune, The Emerging World of Capitalism and Risk in America, also, I haven't read that one, but it seems very fascinating and I plan to one of these days, tells the story of how modern concept of risk emerge in the US. Um, and I think interestingly enough for today's topic too, I also discovered earlier this year that he's co-teaching a class with Chiara Cordelli about property and the public interest, which of course brings its own other set of kind of related considerations here too. Um, I'm gonna leave it at that too, I think. And at this, I'm going to hand it off to John. I think that soon enough, the two of us um, will also be able to have a chance to chat. Hello, everybody. Hi. Um, so thank you, thank you for the invitation. And also, you know, just congratulations to Carson on the exhibition. Congratulations to the Rand and all, all the artists. It's really spectacular. If you hadn't seen it yet, you have what, one more week uh, to get over to the Rand and to see the, the show. I would encourage you to do so. Um, I'll also just quickly interject that the, ah. the images you see in the background are also um, that's right. images from the show too. So. Okay, so 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 you might be asking, you know, why why my why am I here? You know, <laughs> why, why me? I, I think it is because as, as Carson mentioned, I mean, I, I teach regularly, I've taught regularly a course um, on property. I'm teaching at Cordelli this quarter uh, called Property in the Public Interest. And as it happens, it timed wonderfully with this exhibition. So I brought a class, an undergraduate class to the Ren last week. Um, and it was very stimulating, it was, it was great. Um, but I am just a humble historian. Um, I don't talk or write much about art, except in a very kind of amateurish, dilettante kind of you know way. I do do that, and I'll do do you know a bit more of that today in a minute. But what I thought I would do in my remarks is is talk about my um, struggle, which is the right word, uh, to frame property as a historical problem, and hopefully that struggle will resonate with the exhibition. Actually, I know it will because the exhibition has actually kind of helped me think about that struggle and begin to um, 
um, you know, work on it a little bit. I mean, I, I, I teach property. I've thought a lot about property. Um, I've never written about property except indirectly. Because uh, I haven't found a way to do it yet to my satisfaction. I mean, it's motivated. So I think I am going to write a book about property someday. Um, I actually have on my um, hard drive, on my hard drive, in the cloud. <laughs> I actually have in the cloud a uh, proposal for a book on the history of, of property, which I abandoned last year uh, because it was bad. You know, I actually reread it this morning and it, it confirmed my belief that it, it is bad. <laughs> So far, you know, but it's it's a work in progress. I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to it. What the book was gonna do, um, provocatively, uh, was to argue something which I think is right, but really is just a provocation, which is to say that private property is a myth. Um, it doesn't exist, or at least it doesn't exist the way that people think it does. Uh, that private property is actually a series of myths um, and counter myths. That like all myths, all myth making, uh, you know, tell us stories, stories about property that are actually geared towards other purposes to make sense of things like the state um, or inequality, um, perhaps efficiency, economic efficiency. I'm thinking about how economists talk about property. Uh, so myths about property, I think, do help us understand the state or inequality uh, or the market. Um, but they don't help us understand property. Um, so what all this means is that we really don't know what property is. I mean, I think we know what property rights are. I'm going to say more about that in a second. But we don't know what property is, how to kind of focus or delimit the problem or acquire the right depth of field. Which is odd because property is clearly very important. I mean, how could you say it's not? And so when you have a phenomenon that's so important, that I think is so clouded in kind of confusion and obfuscation, I think it tells you that something really important is happening uh, and that it's worth more thought. But what? You know, and I guess I haven't figured that out yet. Um, let me talk about some of my efforts, you know, and hopefully refer to uh, the exhibition along the way. Okay, so. Um, you know, history, right? History, who wants to hear some history? Here's one story or sort of one history of property. It goes, you know, it goes like this. Um, it starts in Rome. You know, the Romans had a very unique conception of property, uh, which was the concept of dominion. Uh, it's a patriarchal con concept of property. Uh, the paterfamilias, the head of household, enjoys complete, absolute, exclusive property rights over objects, persons, including slaves, but also lands. So that's very important His conception of property applies to all things that can be brought under the dominion um, of the owner. Complete, exclusive, absolute property rights. Okay. With the collapse of Rome, you know, yada, 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 um, you know, feudalism, property becomes split up, divided, encumbered, shared, uh, communal in all sorts of ways. But then in medieval times with the growth of commerce in Europe, with the rise of capitalism, kind of Roman notions of dominion in the form of private property make a comeback. And the rise of private property in the West, and we should associate the private uh, rise of private property with the West, led to things like the enclosure of the commons, uh, the splitting up of communal forms of land ownership into private forms, but really the end of all communal reciprocal forms of property ownership in Europe. In Europe, that process was bound up with the rise of the property-bearing, rights-bearing individual subject, what C.B. McPherson called possessive individualism, which was associated with the birth of liberalism. So we get a lot of isms uh, coming Property, right, gets abstracted from specific human relationships and contexts. This is a notion of property, you know, very much on display in the exhibition, I think. Um, I don't know what's behind me now, if I'll get lucky, but uh, Benedict de Paul and Reuter's Undercover and Solid Object uh, presents the kind of ghost outline of a Chicago Board of Trade trading pit. It's a foreign trading pit. Is that right? Foreign trading pit. 
where futures, kind of the ultimate capitalist abstraction of property, uh, were once traded. But at the exhibition, you don't have the pit. They have the pit. Mm -hmm. they, have, well, they have the pit. We just have the kind of outline of the form uh, of the pit. So what you see on the floor, floor is kind of property as just sort of emptied out geometrical space. And there's a kind of patent filing in their own sort of manifesto, which makes it very clear that they understand this geometric form as to be kind of coordinates of, of domination, right, and dispossession. The spread of, I mean, I'm still in this same story, the spread of the Western concept of private property throughout the world with imperialism and conquest um, is part and parcel of slavery, part and parcel of colonialism, and the sort of vast dispossession of non-Western peoples, a very unfortunate phrase, by the quote-unquote West. Here, one recall, uh, recalls Rousseau's remark in the discourse on the origin of inequality, uh, that from, quote, the first man who having enclosed a piece of ground bethought himself of saying, this is mine, right? From that ensued, quoting Rousseau, so many crimes, wars, murders, horrors, misfortunes. A thought uh, distilled a century after Rousseau by the French anarchist Proudhon in the famous expression, the title of his book, Property is Theft. So, and Rousseau, I think, is the kind of great master of this narrative. He's the sort of touchstone. Okay, so Europe, the West, the United States imposes the institution of, of property, of private property, perhaps imposes the institution of property itself on the world. It's not pretty. And this is a history that explains why the world today is riven by such great disparities in power, privilege, and property. Okay, so that's a story about property. It's a history of property, an account of what property is, right? Property is about absolute, exclusive, abstract, private rights to ownership and possession, which entails inherently dispossession. That's a story about the history of property, about what it is, and it's true, you know. It's not false, um, but it's, it's incomplete, or at least it's not the whole truth. And I think it is a myth, actually. Now, myths can be true. Um, I, actually, it's a counter myth or a narrative created first by 19th century socialists and also some anarchists, Rousseau very seriously indeed. It's a counter myth to another myth which preceded it, which was the European Enlightenment attempt to justify private property rights and thereby not explain the origin of inequality, uh, but to justify the existence of the state, and justify its legitimacy. So here one can turn not to Rousseau, but to Locke, who told a famous, infamous, just so story about how things were in a proverbial state of nature in which, quote, all the world was America, all land was held in commons, a just so story to explain ultimately why property came about and ultimately why the state came about to ensure and uphold property rights. All right, so myths are these kind of just so stories that refer to an origin to explain why things are the way they are in the present. You know, why do we have a state? What grounds is legitimacy? You know, Locke turned to a mythic history of property leading to labor mixing with the land and private property rights uh, to make sense of that question. Why do we have so much inequality today? It's sort of Rousseau's question. Well, it must be because in the past, the institution of private property and the men who benefited from it unjustly dispossessed so many of the world's peoples of what was rightfully theirs, whether it was their persons in the history of slavery or land held in common, or in the case of the history, excuse me, in the case of enclosure, or perhaps uh, the kind of history of, of indigenous dispossession. All right, so again, all these arguments, which I think have fundamentally shaped our understanding of what property is, really aren't about property at all, right? They use property functionally to tell these stories about something else, the state, imperialism, capitalism, inequality. And they end up, I would argue, always reducing the phenomenon of property uh, to the phenomenon of property rights or really the justification or not of property rights. So that's another narrowing. Okay, now let me shift gears completely and ultimately get to you know art um, and, and tell a story about property that involves not narrowing, but, but actually stretching, right? 
those both those narratives I just told about property um, don't really hold. It's why I'm calling them myths. I mean, they don't hold up that well at all in light of mm, call it the last generation of research by scholars, mostly historians, um, but even more so anthropologists um, on property. So let me say a few words about you know what you learn about in, in, in that sort of corner of the uh, the library. Um, so in my class last week on property, um, we, we read what I think is just an amazing book called Property and Dispossession, Natives, Empires, and Land in Early Modern North America. It's by a Canadian historian named Alan Greer. It was published, I think, in 2018, 19. So it's recent. So Greer was not the first to do so, but I think he just destroys, you know, just destroys the argument that property is a Western institution that was imposed by the West onto the rest, in his case, by the English, then British, French, and Spanish empires, you know, onto uh, Native Americans. And, and no, he says, we have to understand, you know, the encounter between Europeans and indigenous peoples as really an encounter between two, well, many different forms of property, different property systems. So all peoples have property. And I said, this is an anthropological kind of insight, which I think is somewhat synonymous with saying all people have culture, right? I mean, what makes human beings unique? We live under culture, we have language, and therefore we all have property. It's a basic category of human existence, culture, and being. <laughs> Okay, here's Greer's, as I take it, kind of working definition of property. He says, the word property is best seen as directing attention to a vast field of cultural as well as social relations to the symbolic as well as the material context within which things are recognized and personal as well as collective identities are made. I think I'll read that again, and I'm going to maybe uh, say he, the word things here, I think you could actually put, I think people are things too in his account. So it's also a way that people get recognized. So that kind of encompasses the property rights, rights-bearing subject, uh, possessive individualism story. The word property is best seen as directing attention to a vast field of cultural as well as social relations to the symbolic as well as the material context within which things are recognized and personal as well as collective identities are made. It's true, Europeans are weird. I mean, I would say a few words, more words about that. They had this Roman conception of dominion, which was actually an invented tradition uh, of medieval, medieval Europe by like three guys at the University of Bologna in the late 12th and early 13th century that reinvented this notion of Roman dominion. Um, they have this thing where they can think in terms of absolute, exclusive, abstract, property rights. They had it. I mean, probably other people's Native Americans, you know, maybe they didn't quite have that. Maybe not. But they did have property, right? All Native American peoples. And Greer, referring um, to the Americas, uh, talks about a, quote, almost infinite variety of indigenous property systems, which can't be reduced to one form of, you know, Native property, right? Doesn't work like that. And again, I think here the homology between property and culture, um, you know, comes out again. So I won't try to summarize Gray's account of that infinite variety will be here for the rest of our lives. But, you know, just to make a number of points relevant to the exhibition um, that belong to Greer, and then maybe a few of my own too. All right. So one is any account that sets up um, indigenous property systems as focused on community and reciprocity as the antithesis of European notions of private individual property, you know, including Locke's account of that, just, just fails. They just don't hold water. And Greer shows that actually what dispossessed Native Americans of their land, especially New England, uh, was not the European privatization of property, if you will, not a notion of private property rights, not dominion, uh, but rather uh, the European understanding of the commons. So English settlers had a commons, unenclosed property, to which individuals and groups enjoy non-exclusive use rights. So everybody can cut wood here. Everyone can hunt in this forest. Everyone's animals can graze in these 
fields or pastures. And, you know, you shouldn't be nostalgic, right, about that understanding of the commons, because that was actually the tip of the spear that spread first and first dispossessed Native Americans and led to the kind of wars and conflicts which solidified that dispossession. So it's actually a conflict between, not between private property and communal, but between two very different communal understandings of property, which nonetheless had resonances. And, and this communal thread, you know, runs through today to here in the United States. I mean, it's one of the takeaways of the class that I teach. And it's also, I think, in the exhibition too. I mean, there are no absolute private property rights, not even, not even in the United States, right? There's no artwork in the show that's not in relation to another, right? That kind of stands independently or exclusively. More practically, what does that mean? You know, the state can take your property, right? It can tax it, or it can literally seize it. It can take your house through eminent domain, or just through a takings, you know, providing compensation. All the state has to do is invoke the public interest or some kind of notion of public use. What is public interest or public use? I mean, the law of the land is pretty much whatever the state can get away with in saying is a public interest. So, you know, private property law, private property law, you know, in the United States, the country which celebrates private property rights unlike any other, you know, provides vast, you know, just vast legal scope for legitimate expropriation, right? I mean, legitimate expropriation. Okay, so related to that, you know, the kind of primacy of the communal always, right, in property is Greer's second point, that there was a lot of common understanding between European and indigenous populations around the world, you know, about what property was, because everybody had some form of communal or public notion of property and collective ownership, which again, comes back to the idea that everybody had culture and language and that there are real differences and limits, but there's commensurability uh, across culture and language too. All right, here are my own sort of, you know, takeaways. <laughs> Europeans, especially the English, <clears throat> especially Americans, what makes their notions of property distinctive and, and strange? It's not private property. It's not that. Um, it's kind of two other things. First, Europeans, and this is where we get into the myth-making, they're obsessed with questions of legitimacy and justification. Right? They're just obsessed with this normative question of why property and property rights should or should not exist. It's a very strange cultural tick. You kind of step back and look at it in comparative um, perspective. Native Americans, you know, vast differences in their property systems. You just don't see that same fear, should I finally invoke that word, of what if we can't justify why property exists? Right? What if we can't do that? Does everything just you know, spill out into anarchy? Right? This is a quality of European and American you know, political culture. It's not so much a quality of other political cultures. Um, I think Greer's book shows that, but there's also a vast body of scholarship he doesn't draw on, but could have, can't do everything, on American slavery, uh, which ties into kind of new anthropological and historical accounts of property in Western Africa and how they continued uh, under American slavery, on how slaves, black slaves in America, uh, even though they were held as property by whites who were obsessed with justifying their property ownership over black people and black persons, nonetheless, slaves had their own extra legal, informal systems of property for regulating access and use to resources within slave communities. Right, they had that. And that's a history that extends beyond slavery, past late emancipation, and through today. And so here I'll, I'll take, oh, it's the last one. Here's, yep. Okay, all right. No, that's okay. <laughs> it, it all comes around. I'll take the occasion to refer to Kevin Beasley's uh, Valentine's Pines, which I love. I love it. Um, in his own words, the artist, uh, eh, it'll come around. It's coming soon. It's coming soon. Okay. <laughs> coming soon. Uh, uh, can you go back to that one, actually? Uh, okay, Here's we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. Okay, this is Beasley. This is his words. This work is a continuance of my reconciling Black land ownership, its use, and its legacy, channeled through my own family's experience 
I have found it important to understand the ills, difficulties, and beauty associated with a multi-generational presence in a place and on a property that has provided so much joy, grief, and discovery. This image marks the different bloodlines in my family and how a property once owned as one residence is now separate. There are at least three to four bloodlines in this property, and the uncertainty of its cohesion is a reality from generation to generation, the fear of what it may become. Okay, very different language we're talking about. Of course, there's a visual language for making sense of or entering the question of what is property and how to make sense of it uh, than the kind of languages I've been referring to or using earlier in my, my talks. I wanted to strike that juxtaposition. The second point, which I'm just going to leave dangling in the air because I, I don't quite know what to make of it, although it's got a lot to do with a lot of things going on here. Maybe Carson can make the connection. No pressure. <laughs> English, the English are strange because they found it, I don't want to say easy, but they found a way by the early modern, you know, 16th century, it's there. It's earlier, but the 16th century, you can really see it. Um, to commensurate land as a form of property with money, you know, that commensuration, which... Um, that commensuration is at work in the exhibit because the, the kind of universal medium that makes it possible to make all the juxtapositions that are at work in the exhibition. And I think conceptually somehow money makes that possible um, as a concept. And there, um, Native American, I, I'm, the, the, the infinite variety of indigenous forms of property in Greer's book, they understand property, but commensurating, and they understand rights, right? But commensurating, Property and, and land is a different, um, that's a different show. I mean, I wish I had another thought here, but I think it's important. But it's, I'm suggesting the account we need to understand the trajectory that gets us to uh, the Chicago Board of Trade, right? And it's kind of expression there. It's not a trajectory that has to do with private property rights. It, it, it would have to be an account of money, you know, and how money begins to encompass or how money interacts with with property. So actually, if you want to read law, right, I actually think the most important passages are not about property rights, but about money and accumulation. All right, I, I said, I'll just have to leave that point dangling in the air. Okay, so what's what's great about um, Greer's book, and I think about this new historical literature I'm referring to, which draws from new and old anthropological literatures, is that it demonstrates, I think, persuasively that all, all people have had property, that there's an infinite variety uh, when it comes to property, and that property is a rather universal human institution, although it iterates over time and space, you know, in different right ways. And so when you do that, you step back, or you step out of uh, framing property through the stories, the kind of myths and counter myths, they're obsessed with justifying or not um, private property rights. Which isn't to say you shouldn't read Locke and Marx and Proudhon and Hegel and all the. I mean, you should, you know, but just to recognize it's a very narrow conversation, uh, and that actually the kind of language and conversation happening here maybe tells you more. I think it does tell you more about what property is um, than reading those kind of classic, um, you know, canonical works. So I, I kind of mentioned that this history, this history, and the anthropological literature I'm kind of you know obsessed with now because I think they actually maybe help us bridge. Um, these different mediums, but also, you know, conduct a similar move, which is to kind of broaden out, right? Um, in this case, using art or art objects as a means to, you know, accomplish that that same end. So when you walk into the exhibition, you see Christopher Williams' photograph of these three sleep models. And you think, or at least I thought, what does that do with property, right? Um, you can get there, but you think, what does that have to do with property? He, he says, of the, I mean, the photographs really use focus and depth of field. He says, the, what he's, to focus is to assert a preference for one surface over another. What value or significance is assigned to this focus and why is it privileged? What are the ideological implications of depth of field? Okay, so this, this, yeah, this, so I wondered what does have to do with property? And actually in the end, it helped me make it helped me understand my own struggle to figure out what property is, you know, because to make sense of property, I mean, for me, this is the question, you know, just how much do we need to focus, define, and delimit 
what property is or not. And, and again, that I think is why I'm so stuck. But, you know, the exhibition, you know, it's helping me get maybe a little bit unstuck. Um, one of the more in this key, you know, thought provoking juxtapositions in the exhibition for me was, you know, the CBOT, the Board of Trade, the kind of ghost trading floor, um, along with um, those two silk screens of um, who's the artist? Rose Salon. Thank you, Rose Salon. Those two silk screens of, of building engineers, their notes for the maintenance of the American Stock Exchange from 2006 7 before the financial crisis. So that, you know, it kind of presents the very opposite of, of capital or property as kind of extreme capitalist abstraction. Because you get these minute details of the of the building, you know, even if you know the purpose of the building is financial abstraction through trading. So it's very concrete sense of the building, but the point of the building is to abstract. So that kind of narrowing and broadening kind of happening, you know, at the same time and how to how to think about that. And I think there is a, a language available in the exhibition to kind of think through those issues that you can't find, um, at least I haven't found elsewhere. <clears throat> okay, so maybe now I'll, I'll conclude. I'll conclude um, with a question for you. Sure. Okay. The, I mean, so I said like how I got stuck in my sort of failed book project. Um, actually, there's a problem with that broadening move too, which maybe some of you are already thinking about. I mean, it's a problem that's very thoughtfully kind of demonstrated in the exhibition itself. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it's not myth, right? But it's a, it's a delimitation problem, right? Let me reread this uh, definition of property. It's actually not Greer's. It's from a um, mid 20th century anthropologist of Native America of the Salto people of uh, present day Southern Canada uh, by an anthropologist named Irving Hallowell, A. Irving Hallowell, who trained many important New Chicago anthropologists, including Ray, uh, excuse me, Roy Fogles and George Stocking. Okay, I'll read it again. The word property is best seen as directing attention to a vast field of cultural as well as social relations to the symbolic as well as the material context within which things are recognized and personal as well as collective identities are made. Okay, that sounds nice, but what doesn't, I mean, what, what doesn't direct attention to the vast field of cultural as well as social relations, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so what is not property, you know? Um, there's, a, there's a danger to making property homologous to culture. Um, if everything is property, that's a problem because we can't think or see or create everything all at once. You know, we're not gods. Um, so that's kind of where I got stuck of kind of feeling like our standard accounts of property are very narrow, preoccupied with justification, and are really myths. Um, but here's this more expansive um, concept of property that I think is more workable, but then where do you draw the lines? on it. And I think that that problem is staged by the exhibition mm -hmm. itself, probably consciously so. But so, okay, so now I'll, I'll turn to you and ask, you know, where did you draw the line? Now, I, I wanted to say something about lines. I'll, I'll save it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the line, yeah, you probably know where I'm going. Um, so this is Rose Salon's work. This is Rose Salon. Okay. I don't, I, maybe I'll say something about lines in a bit, but I should stop talking. Mm -hmm. But where did you draw the line or the limit? you know, what went into this exhibition and whatnot, right? What did, it mean, what did it mean for a work of art to be enough about property or or not enough about property? And maybe we can start. It's, our a, it's a very, yeah, it's a very interesting question. I like it a lot too. And I think like, um, yeah, where would I start on that one specifically? So I will say like, in some ways I like doing exhibitions like this one, or it starts with something that seems like very familiar, you know, mm -hmm. like property is this thing, like you hear this word all the time, we have some kind of connections within our daily lives, like, but very, very quickly you start to realize like, oh, like there is this problem with what exactly, as you're saying, like what exactly is property and like, for myself quickly come up with this kind of moment where like trying to figure out how to define it, what is included, what isn't, you know, and, and it seems like in some ways you can think of it in very, very technical terms, like aware of this kind of sense that there are these misconceptions and kind of common conversation about you think of it as things, but it's not specifically, you know, it's like it goes beyond that. So like these sorts of things from the very beginning were part of my kind of awareness too, but like um, 
I don't know, in the sense also, there's a delimiting process mm. that happens um, in the sense of knowing that our space is limited. Like we're not an incredibly large museum to begin with. We have one room that's around 80 feet wide, 40 feet wide, the other direction and 30 feet tall. And like, that's the sense of where we're starting from too. So like at some point you can only invite so many artists in, you know, so it starts with the kind of deep awareness that I could not possibly do something that's in any way a comprehensive accounting for this. Mm -hmm. um, but within that, wanting to be able to invite a number of enough artists to, um, to know, on one hand, start suggesting some of the breadth of different things that might be contained here. However, though, I would also say too that like, I go into this project not feeling like I have my own kind of confidence in a, in a supremely crisp definition of property either. So to some extent, it's interesting seeing that that's something to a certain extent and I had to bracket off to begin with, you know? So it's like, it was really interesting in recent weeks kind of reading, um, you know, portions of your Ages of American Capitalism book and like many, many academic books, it starts with some sense with questions of definition, you know? And I think we could return to that and some of the choices you make there of how to define capitalism becomes like a very illuminating thing and sets the frame for a larger project there. For something like this though, I knew from the beginning that I didn't want to necessarily go to each of the artists and say like, here's property, here's how we're thinking about it. In some ways it's quite the opposite where like, you know, um, there's 17 artists in the show or in some, in some case, some of them are groups. Like a lot of the work itself is made entirely new for the exhibition. And then there's a number of the works themselves that have existed where in conversation with the artists, we decided what to put in, I think. Um, so to some extent, I think like, I didn't necessarily want to lead the witness in a way and say like, here's how you should think about it. I was actually much, much more interested in coming from the other direction and saying like, I'm doing this show about property, you can start to point to some of the things that might kind of be in play here but also like stepping back a little bit and then seeing what they come forward. So I think um, I will say quite honestly, it's like there's a kind of beautiful moment of surprise also as the artists kind of make these works to see where they go with it too. And I think there are aspects like elements within the show kind of um, material forms. There are these different kind of anchors that appear too that weren't things that I necessarily would have anticipated or invited. And I think like in some of those, I'm still kind of after the show opens thinking through and kind of trying to reckon for myself, like, well, this seems like something where the artists themselves very, very quickly said, like, I want to go here. Um, and then trying for myself to figure out what does that lead us back around to? And even certain kind of undercurrents that started appearing in multiple works that start to suggest something important here. So I'm in the process also of connecting the dots here a little bit. And, and even kind of hearing you describe Greer's book and some of these things is quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Like, it's kind of emphasis of culture and language in relation to property is really interesting too, because I think there are some of the works, there's way more of these works that are bringing in these kind of questions of language forward than I ever anticipated. Mm -hmm. And I think like actually hearing that these sorts of kind of frameworks are coming up in some kind of recent scholarship around property is very interesting too, because I think that was something I did not anticipate here, but I think the artists got there first too, you know? So I don't know, I might stop there and pause there at least, you know, and mm -hmm. see kind of where you made that response. Well, I'm waiting for, I'm waiting for things to cycle here. So what are they talking about? about? Yeah, but I don't remember. It's the indigenous, the um oh, it sounds like Arkin's installation. Oh, the hallway, I think. No, 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 no. Okay. It's um it's called Untitled. <laughs> oh, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it'll come, it'll come back around. As with the cycles, we can imagine ourselves kind of walking into the show here. Yeah. This does kind of loosely follow a progression of yeah. thing too. So in a moment, we will see the Christopher Williams photograph you mentioned. Does anybody want to say anything? I have a yeah. question about, okay. um, is there anything interactive or participatory about the exhibit? Um, like I saw the Fisher Price, and you touched them. Yeah, I think. Um, so I think like, and I think it's an interesting question. Is there anything kind of interactive or, or um, participatory? Like, I think not in the sense of their, of their being an invitation for you to kind of take the toys and walk around with them or to kind of actually manipulate them or buttons press on any of the technological work. So in that sense, like um, the works themselves aren't scripted as, um, as a kind of participatory experience. But I think it's, I mean, I think it's an interesting framework too. And, and I do really like the question of like, of you as a viewer walking in here, like what is your role as someone who is kind of engaging with these works and also with the kind of space right. as a whole, you know? So it's like, even if the work themselves isn't asking you to pick it up, I don't know, I like it as a question. Like what is your mm -hmm. piece in this? Feels like an interesting question on its own too. 
Um, so this is this the work you were thinking of? Yeah, yeah. that's the one because it, it, it's lines, right? So it actually it, you can't quite see it here. I mean, it's worth going to see, but the, the there's lines that actually don't touch. Yeah. Um, so there is a sense of like a property line, but then it is also a, a depth of field and focus yeah. where you can kind of actually see the yeah holes kind of rise out of it that seem to transcend the line. Um, it's a remarkable work too. Uh, I did want to say in response to that question that we, when I had the class, um, Little Mouth of Cherries was what they gravitated to the most. And you touched the stage, the, the little, uh, and you touched the TV while you were explaining it, and they were taken aback. Yeah. Yeah, because you had physically touched it. Um, it's like, oh my God, you can touch it. Yeah. Well, you can touch that. I don't know if it's participatory, yeah. but <laughs> it's the truth, you know, yeah. I think like the sense of like, a, um, you'll see it in another of these photographs, it's like a television sitting on the ground and there is a portable stage. It's a hard to like read exactly what it is at first. So I think because it is all kind of folded up and it's crunched, so it's not, and it's kind of, that's too. Um, I mean, to me, I think like the, one of the most interesting questions about like, um, I don't know, your role in this or this kind of participatoriness. So I think you can see it's like an unconventional way of presenting the exhibition where like, I kind of wanted to, in the spirit of kind of trying to figure out, like, this is a delineation question in its own way, of like, you know, how do you have 17 artists in one room creating individual spaces for themselves, like wanting to, in some sense, create these different spaces, but without turning it into a labyrinth or feeling like it's a convention or an art fair or something like that, you know, and I, in the end, made this kind of unconventional choices kind of in the staging of the exhibition to have these half-built walls, you know, and I think, um, to me, I think there's something quite interesting about visually it does something mm -hmm. through to other rooms, like, Christopher Williams photograph and talking about kind of the focal planes clicked it into place for me, where like you could have that experience of things kind of moving behind each other as you walk around. But there is this kind of question too of like, what do you do with these walls? And they're wide enough that you could actually step through them, I think. And that's this other kind of choice too. So I think like without kind of making too fine of a point of it or, or kind of like forcing the question when you walk in, mm -hmm. to me, I think it's interesting to observe as, as someone walks through the exhibition, do they decide to walk around to the doors or just go straight through? And like, and I'm not here to stop you one way or another kind of this is the chairs. So yeah, so Little um, Little Mouth of Cherries is this installation by Neela Far and Mami Far and Essek on Barbary mm -hmm. um, that they made newly for it too. And um, I don't know, John, this actually makes me want to flip back a question to you. Go I for think. it, yeah. So that work is an interesting, it's it's worth kind of describing it a little bit because it is hard to get a sense of it when you're standing here. So on one hand, you see a television on the ground um, that has this actual security footage from um, uh, hospital in Palestine. And you're seeing these kind of, Israeli secret agents in disguises going in and taking someone out. And then on another wall, you have this poem in this kind of shimmering um, silver vinyl lettering um, has Arabic stanza and then a translation in English down on the ground. And, it, and it's a love poem, you know? And I think like, so here's another kind of work that's bringing in some of these kind of questions of language and culture. And I know Islam yeah. himself started thinking about like, well, what is it for someone to literally kind of take your culture and perform it towards like the end of something else? Um, but I think like the thing I'm sort of thinking about here too, they're folding these two, two different moments in time and these two different places. So I think like, I'm curious, like as, as you approach a show um, like this as a historian and your own work as a historian, like how do you find yourself navigating some, these moments where artists themselves well, are bouncing between past and present? Yeah, I mean, you, like, I, I didn't, this is not what I want to say. I mean, I didn't, you know, the, 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 the my, stillborn book project on property. Like what I wanted, what I, so private property is a myth, we need it more expansive. I mean, I think what property about is about is it's how uh, societies and cultural order space and time. Like, I think that actually is what property does. Um, so in, in here, I think the perspective is to not think about the origins of property, where does property come from? But to think about like what does property do, right? Like what are the effects of property or consequences of property in the world? Um, so space, that's that's you know, you can think of um, patterning um, how societies order the use of resources spatially. And, and there, you know, private property or exclude the ability to exclude, you know, or create property lines, territory, jurisdictions, like that's at stake. And then a lot of property is about time, mm -hmm. um, inheritance. So just think of inheritance or kind of how um, 
um, societies create a sense of economic continuity over time. You know, property is the form. And so there, I think the resonance with culture and language, you know, is really strong. The, but okay, but within that, you know, framework, um, that kind of idea of spatial temporal order, you know, property commiserates, but it also leads to kind of failures of, you know, commiseration, which I think is the point of Beer's book, right? He actually says, look, the, for 200 years, 200 years is a pretty long time, property created a, a com common medium of understanding and exchange between Europeans and Native Americans until it didn't anymore, you know, and that's where money and capitalism become kind of important, but that, that's kind of another story. So I think that the, you know, Little Mouth of Cherries, um, it has all that, you know? So it has the story about space because it has this video. Can you describe the video? Because I might not do it justice. Yeah, I think, um, so you're, you're seeing, you can see um, it's a single like fixed camera and it, it switches once kind of within this loop and it loops it. Yeah. Um, and you're basically seeing clearly security cameras, color footage, and you can tell it's a security camera based on like the notations on it. One part says camera eight, I think, and it mm -hmm. has like a date stamp. And at some point it seems like you're just looking through a hallway first, like what looks like it could be a parking garage or something. And later kind of like a building that I think we can tell you it's a hospital and you might be able to kind of piece that together as you see people walking around. And then you see like this, this um, almost like this mob, this group of men kind of moving through. And then at times as they get closer, you can see some of them are wearing what clearly seem to be fake beards. Um, there's one person who's dressed up as a pregnant woman, someone else is kind of an elderly man. Um, and then you see some of them pulling out guns and these sorts of things. And then something happens and then to leave again. And like um, describing like what you see, that's kind of yeah. exactly what, what kind of transpires at least. You know? Yeah, so you have that kind of territorial dispossession in the Israeli form of settler colonialism, you know, which is kind of staged all over the, um, the exhibition in different ways. The Kodak, uh, there's one there, those kind of Kodak, um, um, Kodak, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of those paintings, obviously this um, as well. You know, is is another kind of version of that. So you have the kind of space, but then you're right. Then you have this poem from what eleventh century, eleventh century Andalusia, yeah. um, in which uh, which is another kind of historical. Uh, what's the right word I'm looking for? Often treated as a, a moment of a kind of middle ground exchange of cultures, in which actually there was kind of commiseration you know, across religion, across language, across understanding, and the, and the poem kind of expresses that. So it expresses both, you know, the possibility of commiseration, you know, by stretching across time, but then also tells another story through the video of kind of the, a lack of commiseration and a kind of like violent dispossession and ongoing violence, um, spatially, in terms of the Israel, Israeli, you know, version of, of a, a colonization of Palestine. So, yeah, so I kind of saw both of those working. I mean, we, our class, we sit there for a long time trying to make, here it is, I, the table I still don't know. <laughs> but we sit there for a long time trying to kind of, okay, well, how do these fit together? And that's kind of ultimately where I, you know, came out. I mean, I mean I'm really interested in this idea of property as how cultures order space and time. Mm -hmm. It makes me want to walk through the exhibition again and start thinking about like, well, what kind of orderings of time and space are happening within each of the works? You know, like Andrew Norman Wilson's work here is another kind of interesting go. example too, where like, you know, literally what you're seeing is this collage of two very different kind of imageries. And there's two of these works and they both are kind of compiled in the same way of these scans of these 1910s and 1920s Kodak ads, when Kodak is literally putting ads out and kind of trying to tell you what the powers of a camera is before everyone has one in their pockets. And then these kind of digital imageries that like the artist now can buy that somebody else has made and put on the marketplace, you know, like, but I think like there's something interesting about the kind of combination of the original imagery that starts that's old and new, but each of them also has its own, I think, tells ways that feel less like these temporal stories and almost more of these spatial ones. Like the other one that you're seeing as a photographer with a huge kind of like box field camera, you know, you're seeing kind of a vista of like a, um, I don't know, it seems like from the American West or something like that. And then you see these kind of side, these marks on the side of like these outlines of a of uh, a map, you know, and I think the Kodak ad originally is kind of telling you like photography can give you this more accurate representations of things. But like, I think Norm Wilson, the artist is also picking up on how it becomes this kind of longer trajectory of like technolo new technologies at the time yep. leading on to these surveying, which is on the research extraction and stuff. But the thing I'm kind of thinking about now here too, like from the beginning, that work brought to mind this like George Perec passage. Have you read that book, Species of Spaces? Mm -hmm. Like really fascinating book too, where he's kind of does this telescoping thing. Mm -hmm. It's like, 
you know, larger and larger scale, but I think it's, you know, eventually through like the city and the countryside and stuff. But I think it's interesting that he makes the case that like space starts on a page hmm. and he talks about these Portolano makers, like putting their name, like putting names literally on coastlines and stuff like that. And then kind of that puts me hmm. in mind of that piece a little bit too, or in some sense, like these weird, um, I don't know, these technologies or this sense of like, how are we looking at this thing and, and sticking clean become these spatial questions too. So like, I don't know, I'm seeing these collapses of space and time. Well, obviously space. this is a, another way of, of uh, the, the scale question, right? Being important yeah. and, and this we're seeing scaling here, obviously. Yeah, and I think that kind of question of scales too. Like we'll see a, a photograph again of the trading floor piece that you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier and we can kind of linger on that again. But but there is this kind of interesting shift in the scale too, where it's like the we could talk more about that piece by Glenn Lung, who's um has these kind of off-the-shelf toys there and you become kind of a giant. But I think the thing about that was really interesting to me about how Marissa, David, and Daniel um staged their new iteration of this project dealing with the Chicago Board of Trade. Mm -hmm. And the trading pit is that like it is like a literally to scale outline, you know, it's like it's on the floor. Here's itself. a photograph. Yeah. And what you can't quite see here is that there's a black woman in the center who's cleaning the floor. Or actually is kind of taking the cover off the floor to probably prepare for the day's trade. Yeah, to the question of two seconds. Yeah, and well, it's converted. I know it's you can see it, but I then will and Thinking about subjects and, and this idea of, you know, like property as a language or a culture or, you know, the ordinary principle for time and space. Uh, what do you think is the role of subject, like the kind of like uh, concrete embodiment of property, right, in each one of these iterations? Because there's one thing, there's one way in which it's like the structure, right, like this language that is necessarily common and collective. But there's also a particular way in which, you know, each iteration of a particular property has like, is at the same time you know, affecting that language. And like, do you think that is expressed? Like, it sounds uh, from your remarks that it is that I don't know, not, I wouldn't call it attention, but like that, you know, two levels, if you want. Like, how does that you know, appear if it appears in there? I think you just agree. Yeah. Um, you're talking about like the kind of manifestations of property and their kind of materializations in different works, I think. Is that kind of? Your question, yeah, I think so. think about, yeah. like, the property, you know, like the the particular, you know, property in, you know, the Israeli occupation or, you know, like the class, like what does the, you know, what's the relation of it? Uh, yeah, where are the subjects, like the individual subjects in this relation? Because we've talked a lot about the structure, right, in the collective, but like what are the, you know, uh, and you mean specifically kind of the people involved? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think I mean, it's an interesting thing to kind of ask yourself walking through the show, actually. And like, and after you go, like, yeah, knock on my door and I'd be curious what your impressions are. I think, I mean, I can speak for myself. I feel like I have different, I have a different kind of sense or awareness as I look at different works of what it kind of seems to be putting forward and communicating there. And I think something that I think is also interesting, like maybe related to that, is I think, um, I don't know, each of the artists on one hand, I think are coming to very different answers to that. And it's interesting to think, how is that kind of visually materialized, manifested physically? But I think like to me, I started also noticing that there's a little bit of this kind of breakdown within the works too, in another way. And I, I think I almost kind of started reaching for like, you know, these analogies from literature or something as a way to think about it. And I think you can think about like a first person narrator or a third person narrator. And I get a little bit of this kind of difference in some works that feel like very much grounded in the artist's own experience, you know, like you read the kind of passage where Kevin Beasley himself was speaking about, um, you know, this, this land that's been held in his family, you know, and it's through his own kind of experience of this land, that then he'll give it a number of, a range of these very different kind of expressions, some very sculptural. In this work itself, we're seeing a combination between something that's using the physical materials from this place, like something that looks like a painting, but also a photograph, you know? So there within a work, you're seeing a multiple different strategies kind of come together. But then there's another work too, like you also read the passage that Christopher Williams wrote kind of related to his photograph. And you can just immediately see the underlying kind of logic I was thinking about it is very different. It's so structural and analytical, you know? And I think there is this kind of split between these different kind of paths that some of the artists are putting out, you know, like finding their way through property through their own kind of experiences. And you get a sense of an, an awareness of a subject that way. And I think then there's other works too that I'm really quite fascinated by like Rose Salon's work where you mentioned earlier, John, that has these screen prints of like over and over just these handwritten marks, you know, we can kind of read them. It's like this shorthand. And I think in some weird way, there's like this weird splitting of the difference there. These things collapse on each other where in some sense, like it's, it's just like we're watching these like patterns and systems that at work, you know, it's kind of repeated labor, people who are, um, you know, um, these teams of people that over time are observing the kind of maintenance of these uh, materials. 
you know, and I think it's easy to almost to bounce off of that, but to look at it in a structural way, but it's something that's so personal too. Like, I mean, Rose was very interested in this herself too, about like, you know, there's something incredibly specific about someone's handwriting, you know, and there are these moments in the kind of long lines here that like suddenly shift register. There's one that says happy father's day, you know, like otherwise it's just like facts, 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 all okay, you know? So I don't know, there are these moments like that too, where you start to feel maybe both of these things kind of like moving into alignment or out of alignment? I don't know. I'm, I'm John, I'm curious what you notice along these lines. Well, I sort of, it's not answered your question. I mean, it's not, I, that, that was great. I mean, I, I guess I, it provoked thought that I'll share, which is, you know, isn't answering the, the question, which is a good one, but, um, yeah, like another thing about the exhibition that struck me because I found it in my own, uh, work and teaching is how much land and territory, you know, figure, mm -hmm. um, in its relationship to the subject um, and how the subjects kind of form their identities through property. Um, I mean, I'm not a, a lawyer or a law professor. I don't make property law is not my, I'm not an expert, it's not my subject, but I was kind of putting together, you know, the class I teach and looking for kind of canonical cases, even contemporary cases about like property. I was just struck, like it's always about land, you know, it's mm -hmm. always about control and access and use of, of land. It's like, is there something here on, some you know big Supreme Court case on you know big data or intellectual property and I'm sure there is but you know it, it all seemed to kind of come back to um, land as like the common kind of site um, which is odd too given that kind of property rights discourse which is about subjectivity and personhood and ownership. Um, I mean, I'm curious. Yeah. That makes me think too. Like, there's something really interesting a little bit about the kind of history of futures trading in Chicago yeah. Board of Trade too. And I'm curious, maybe you could say more about this also, but I, I, I know about this a little bit by way of Marissa, David, and Daniel yeah. and their project, but just thinking like, as you were mentioning, like the trading pit that they have, they, you know, at some point you get these shifts to entirely digital trading. You don't have traders on the floor anymore. Yeah. The artists themselves get to take this huge 40 foot pit out and now it's theirs. But I think there's something interesting about this history too. As you said, it was a corn futures yeah. pit. And I think like learning more about like what generated the kind of rise of futures trading as this kind of innovation in yeah. some ways it relates back to like agriculture and trying to equal evil even out kind of farmers profits and these sorts of things throughout the year like but then obviously it kind of spins off into its other realm and and many things follow from that but i'm, I'm curious like if, if that brings us back to some of these kind of questions of land or where where do we start taking this kind of question these very material questions of land to these now immaterial realms or something too you know <laughs> yeah you know that's that's true you know that's definitely right and there's a lot of uh, i mean like lynn cronin's book called Nature's metropolis is a really good account of kind of futures trading and how it relates to land and commodities maybe i'll share um this story which is when I was a graduate student, I was involved at the Chicago History Museum in an oral history project that was uh, interviewing um, traders who had started their careers as pit traders. But as the trading was moving electronically, they were kind of all moving into electronic trading or retiring or whatever. And they were, uh, they were there's a lot of reasons for this oral history project. It was about like Chicago trading families and who's Irish, who's Italian, who's Jewish, and there's a lot of things. But it became clear that actually they were all very sad and depressed about the loss of the pit. Hmm. It, and this does say something about property. Like they had, the, you know, this space, which is about abstracting from land, you know, that they had developed like a very strong effective attachment hmm. to those pits and that they, they deeply missed, you know, this sense of physical presence in the trading space and the kind of sociality of, of interacting with other traders and the calling and the yelling in the paper mm -hmm. as everything moved into like another stage of abstraction, which was just people trading electronically on their own desks. So yeah, I, I don't know. I took something away from that of like even this one act, which fits into that narrative. It certainly does that people had made something out of um, the space that actually kind of cut against the logic of what they were up to all day. That's interesting. Yeah. 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 Uh, we've just got a few questions from online. If I can sure. pose those, I'll just read. You've got three, so I'll just I'm going to stand here so I'm by the mic so you can hear me. Um, I'll read all of them and then you can respond as you like. Uh, Samson Oringer says, "Hi, Professor Levy. Your class was my favorite. I took as an undergrad." One question. <laughs> One question that seems to arise when discussing the comments. Samson, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm just I'm just put a name to the thing. Okay, so, okay. Yeah. Uh, one question that seems to arise when discussing the commons or public property generally is the existence of public-private as a sort of dialectical relationship. 
Does public property always depend on slash invite the emergence of private property or vice versa? Mm. Can it be abstracted or divorced from that? This seems to become a question about the process of making art as well. Um, then a comment from Claire and question from Claire Holland. It was interesting visiting, wanting to touch the art, but not being allowed to. Property as boundaries versus property as ownership. How are visitors supposed to understand what they can touch and what they can't? There is no real boundary, just an uncertain social one. And then um, <laughs> Ann Davis says, has Professor Levy considered histories of property by Katerina Pistor and Stuart Banner? <clears throat> I think that's second question. Yeah, no, I think I mean I think it's it's um it's it's a really interesting question about um <clears throat> yeah what you can and can't touch in a museum too. And I think like it becomes like increasingly um slipperier too, because there are like into your question earlier, there are artists who are very much kind of interested to make works that you can touch. So like, you know, I've I've been in um worked in pre other museums before this too, and like you know, you're constantly running up into these kind of like increasing ambiguities where like some works are telling you can touch them and others they most of you can't. But I think you're right that like it rests along, um, it rests along a, a larger kind of understanding or conventions that you shouldn't touch things too. And like, I mean, on one hand, you can flip back and like, well, where does this come from? And there is this kind of question of preservation, these long-term, long-term caretaking and these sorts of things too. So it's like something about underneath the kind of motivation to avoid touching, there is there's also this kind of like ownership or caretaking question too, and like thinking of a museum as a steward for this thing for this long run. Um, but yeah, I think like there's something that like that it does rest on this understanding um, that this is something you're not supposed to, to do. Like um, I'm curious too, like whether like you know there it's not identical obviously, but there's the, this similar kind of interesting operation around property itself. I remember reading at least one definition of property from some decades ago that was talking about it, it isn't necessarily things, but the property as being these kind of rights that are backed up by these social understandings or laws or these sorts of things too. So it's like I mean, these kind of collision between these kind of larger kind of social configurations and the structure. Yeah, but I mean, as you, I mean, you know, the 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 the, the that word again, fear. You know, the kind of I'm afraid to touch the art. Yeah. You know, it goes back to the origins of museums as institutions, which were class projects to try to kind of socialize people into civility and etc. You know, there were kind of pillars of kind of wealth. And so there's a long kind of history at work yeah. how people kind of come to institutions like museums and, and think about, you know, the propriety of sort of how they could engage works of art or not. And I, you know, there's going to be new chapters to that. Yeah. And I think we're in one. Um, yeah. You know, it sounds like listening to you talk. That's a good thing. I think, yeah. yeah. And I think as you're saying that too, like, so we just saw the, the image of Glenn Lung's work that has the house that's sitting on the floor. I think that's a work where the artists themselves is actually kind of like, pushing these questions a little bit. And I think it's worth talking a little bit and describing what you're seeing there and how it works. There are certain things that don't come across in the images. So like in the kind of physical space or in photos, you can see there are these 15 toys that are just set out on the floor. And these are things that you can buy on Amazon or a toy store or something like that too. But I think the fundamental thing that she's doing intervenes in their kind of life in the world in a different way. And I think rather than the artist owning them or a collector or a museum, like from the very beginning, it enters the like it's the session by a public library and it becomes part of their toy lending library. So like throughout the year, a you know, kid can come in or in with their library card, check one of these things out and they can literally take that object home and play with it and return it when it's due. And like the cycle continues. And as a museum, she's put us in the position where we then have to become a member of the library, contact the librarian, see if all 15 of these toys that are part of this artwork are available. And then we literally check them out. So I think, but then it's interesting too, that it has a completely different kind of existence life when it enters the museum space here. And I think the artist herself isn't worried if you're gonna break the door off of the house. But I think for us as a temporary steward, it's like, we don't wanna send the broken toy back either. So we will kind of protect it. But it's interesting that that work itself kind of enacts this literal shift between what's permissible and what isn't. You know, it's like once it goes back to London, you know, you could walk in, check it out and bring that thing home, you know? So it's like, there's interesting how some of the artists themselves are aware of these kind of operations that are set in motion yeah. and in their own choices can kind of torque those, you know? So. I mean, when we walked in, I kind of pointed to this and I was like, this is odd. I mean, couldn't I just steal this, right? I mean, you know, <laughs> and then you're, you said, let's probably chain to the wall 17 times over. <laughs> um, let me respond to other questions very quickly. We're probably running out of time. I don't know what time it is, but we're probably uh, getting up to the limit. Um, yeah, so I could definitely recommend, you know, those two, two books. Um, I mean, Stuart Banner's written a number of books, but How the Indians Lost Their Land is a really good book about native dispossession. And then Katerina Pistor's Code of Capital, 
is a really excellent move as well. And I think that, you know, property as spatio-temporal order, you know, clearly um, there's a chapter of that history where a capital, you know, becomes the form of property that orders space and time. And that's kind of the chapter we're still in. And her book is an excellent look at that. And then the first question, the, 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 the inability to separate public from private. I mean, I think that's right. I mean, in some sense, that's what that story about uh, commodity traders who are nostalgic about the physical space of the pit that, you know, people will always use an appropriate appropriate public forms of property for their own personal private you know uses and likewise private property always has these encumbrances encumbrances with the public i mean another book that we didn't read at the time that Sam took the class but that um for i gotta go read now because it's for tomorrow is a book called the great De demarcation about the french revolution and and the kind of french revolution's efforts to disentangle public and private and they can't do it, you know. I mean, it's just a failure because it's it, it it's impossible. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that's that's the wrong way to think about property. Instead, it's like how to think about the ways that public and private inevitably entangle, and then what are good forms of entanglement, bad forms of entanglement you know, along those dimensions. Yeah. Maybe as we close, is there any one last kind of question in the room, perhaps? Right. That's it. I mean, it's, it's always a good thing to end with some book recommendations. Yeah. I think. Like I would also yeah. add in um, John's book too, Ages of American Capitalism is kind of amazing. And there's so many things within there that I think you could also could clearly continue as to whether imagining like, I don't know, the vigorous politics of property ownership that have arisen at certain moments, you know, not others, like all sorts of things there too. And I would also say um, for those of you like who might be on campus too, like this Saturday, we'll have the last kind of discussion around the show too, which will be with Eula Biss, who I think is an amazing essayist, starting from a different place, but also thinking about um, these questions of American home ownership and also in her um, new and forthcoming work, some of these histories of enclosure specifically and stuff like that too. So I think that'll be another kind of interesting thing to round this out too. But um, thank you for joining us here today. John, thank you so much. Thank you.